Good day, dear great surgeon. Today, we're gonna talk about a very important topic in MRCS. The vascular surgery is very important in every exam, and if it's a bit confusing, let's crack this from confusion together and let's make out of the vascular surgery a piece of cake. So, get ready and let's have this ride together in our journey through vascular surgery. Lymphedema is due to impaired lymphatic drainage in the presence of normal capillary function cause the accumulation of protein rich fluid subdermal fibrosis and dermal thickening. Characteristically, the fluid is confined to the epifacial space, skin and subcutaneous tissue by the way. The muscle compartment will be free of the edema of the lymphedema. It involves the foot unlike other form of any edema. There may be a buffalo hump on the dorsum of the foot and the skin can't be pinched due to subcutaneous fibrosis. The main types of lymphedema, primary and secondary. Primary, we have to differentiate according to the age onset. Less than one year, it's due to malaria disease. After one year, up to 35 years, it will be a sporadic MEG disease, while after 35 year old, it's a lymphedema tarda. So, melody before one year, MEG from 1 to 35, tarda above 35. While the secondary lymphedema causes are many, like bacterial, fungal, parasitic infection, like the Warsharia by Crofty, by the way, which causes the filariasis. Uh, due to mosquito, lymphatic malignancy, radiotherapy of lymph nodes, surgical resection of lymph node, DVT, thrombophlebitis. So take care again. Lymphedema, primary and secondary, it involves the foot. In the primary, we have the congenital before one year melody. And then after one year, it will be MEG. After 35 years, it will be lymphedema third. So, Hormone operation is reduction procedure for lymphedema with the preservation of the overlying skin, which must be in a good condition by the way. Skin flaps will be raised and underlying tissue excised and the limb circumference typically reduced by a third at least. So Charles operation for lymphedema or the skin subcutaneous tissue around the calf are excised down to the deep fascia and the split thickness graph are placed over the site, may be performed if overlying the skin is not a good condition. A larger reduction in size um, than with human procedure, by the way. So, carotid body tumors are rare tumors, however, they are typically account for 60% of head and neck bar ganglioma. They are usually tumors of middle age. Around 5% are bilateral and 5% are malignant, so this is mostly unilateral and mostly benign. They are rarely found as a part of the MEN2 syndrome, by the way, or neurofibromatosis type 1. So it's associated with MEN2 syndrome or neurofibromatosis type 1. Typically present as asymptomatic neck swelling in the anterior triangle of the neck. Most of the carotid body tumors, around 85% will be sporadic, only 10% familiar, uh, mostly hyperplastic and um, seeing the hyperplastic carotid, uh, carotid body tumor in the high altitude or those on oral contact contra, uh, with uh, COPD by the way. Image will be CT angio of course and duplex ultrasound. Uh, the management will be surgical resection and take care of the other nerves surrounding here. Carotid body tumor is the potato tumor in the anterior neck triangle. In biopsy, there is no carotid body tumor biopsy. There is no renal cell carcinoma biopsy. There is no testicular cancer biopsy. There is no liver cancer biopsy. All of those biopsy are not taken. Take care. Decision of amputation is a very hard decision for us, especially 
plastic surgeons. Because amputations are indicated when the affected limb is one of the following dead, deadly, dead, useless, dead, which is non viable, deadly, where is a boosting or major threat to life, or dead, useless, where it's viable but prosthesis would be preferable for lifestyle. We have a circulation which connects the venous system to the arterial system. That's why a mesenteric vascular occlusion will cause ischemia because there will be no drainage of the blood and there will this will cause a stagnation of the arterial blood circulation. The arterial blood must drain to the vein. If you stop the drainage of the pain, if you are cutting off the tape of water of the tape of the blood, so there will be a stagnation of blood and there will be consequences of ischemia from this stagnation. So take care dearest friends, in the lower limb just like the intestine, we have a venous circulation must drain its blood. If the superficial venous system and the deep venous system have been damaged, this will cause subsequent stagnation of the arterial blood which will subsequently cause limb ischemia which may cause limb loss, unfortunately. A very famous question in the exam about an old man with sudden onset of abdominal pain and almost immediately afterward he passes a large amount of diarrhea. Keep in mind of this classical presentation for acute mesenteric infarction. Diarrhea is mesenteric infarction to be kept in mind especially in old age and you will find this patient to be AF by the way the best investigation and the most appropriate investigation will be CT angiogram by the way which is sensitive up to 95% for diagnosis okay when we are talking about features of arterial ulcer we will have a well demarcated edge as well as a gray white piece to the ulcer due to the ischemia and men are more affected than women as well as this ulcer would be very painful but there will be no ankle swelling. Ankle swelling is more often with venous system problems as well as the mixed arteriovenous disease but often absent in the arterial leg ulcer because it will be due to ischemia. There will be a shrunken leg instead. Dearest great surgeons, take care. In lower limb ischemia you can detect the level of the ischemia by detecting the level of the hairline by just observation. When the patient is just removing his clothes and exposing his lower limb, you can notice the level of the ischemia by the hair loss level. You will find his leg has hair and suddenly abrupt changes of the hair uh, loss. This will be the level of the ischemia and by palpation you will find that below this hairline it more cold and above this hairline it will be more warm because below the hairline this limb has been ischemic for long chronic time. Ischemia is not gangrene but it can lead to gangrene. Take care. Here, a very common case scenario in the records about an old male with expressive dysphagia and right-sided weakness over four hours and the symptoms have now completely resolved. This is a transient ischemic attack. He urgently needs duplex, and in the exam he will not state duplex in the choices. He will state arterial duplex scan instead. So take care again. When you face a transient ischemic attack case in the exam, you choose the most useful investigation for this case would be carotid duplex which is the arterial duplex scan to assess the need of carotid end arterectomy or not. Anchored pressure brachial index is calculated by the lower limb pressure by the highest upper limb pressure. So if there is a calcification it will be greater than 1 and if it's a normal case it will be 1. And the minor stenosis will be from 0.8 to 0.1. To and from 0.5 to 0.8, it will be moderate stenotic lesion. At moderate stenotic lesion, consider duplex at this stage and risk factor management. And if there is a mixed ulcer present, then avoid tight compression bandage. Take care. 
there would be a significant stenosis if the ankle brachial pressure index from 0.3 to 0.5 so below 5 it's significant stenosis and less than 3 it's indicative of critical ischemia and urgent detailed imaging is required Internal memory artery is an excellent conduit for coronary artery bypass by the way. It has better long-term patency rate than venous graft. The thoracoacromial artery is seldom be used as a conduit. So again, internal memory artery is excellent conduit for coronary artery bypass. Conduit is used for bypass. Coronary artery bypass can be using internal memory artery as a conduit, radial artery from the forearm as a conduit, or reversed long softness vein graft as a conduit. But take care, in internal memory artery as a conduit, which is the best by the way, in coronary artery uh, bypass, if you used both of the internal memory artery, this will increase the risk of external wound disease. However, many surgeons will use both, especially for redo surgery. Regarding the radial artery harvest from the forearm ensures that the ulnar collateral working first by even Allen test if not uh, CT angio. Do Allen test, okay? The reversed long softness vein graft typically and most using 7O to 8O proline suture and 6O proline suture for top end. Take care. Once the flow established, anticoagulation reversed using butamine. Patient is taking off bypass and a drop given if needed, sternum closed using a sternal closure device or stainless steel wire. Those are notes besides the conduit bypass. Remember, the great saphenous vein is medially and accompanying the saphenous nerve, while the sural nerve is laterally and accompanying the short saphenous vein. The great is medial. The small is lateral. In case you forget one day, the short is sure and the great is saphenous. The greater saphenous, so the greater saphenous vein with the saphenous nerve and the short saphenous vein with the sural nerve, so the short is sural and the great is saphenous. Of a very common recall, tricky question regarding the deformities of the lower limb and the, the choice of amputation above knee or below knee. He will state you an old female with infected diabetic foot and x-ray show osteomyelitis and her calculium. But take care. He will state only one word that will trick you. That this patient has a fixed flexion deformity in her knee. But normal pulse. You will focus on normal pulse because it's the end of the question. And you will notice the osteomyelitis of the hair calcaneum. And you will forget that she has a fixed flexion deformity. You will say, yes, she has a normal pulse. So let's go with below knee amputation. No, she won't benefit from the below knee amputation. It will be a non-used limb. So, in here, we will consider above knee amputation. We can't do below knee amputation. It will not benefit her. It will be a more deformity. But above knee amputation, she can have a prosthesis and walk if she, if she can still walk. So amputation is a hard choice, but it must be chosen if the limb is dead or deadly or dead useless. If dead, it's non-viable or deadly, cause a potential threat to the whole life of the a patient causing a reperfusion injury, for example, or dead useless when there is a viable but prosthesis would be preferable, like a fixed flexion deformity, by the way. Great surgeon, take care. In lymphedema, there is a big difference between congenital and the primary. Congenital is the onset. Primary is the cause. So, in lymphedema, we have primary and secondary. In primary, we have according to the age onset. If Less than one year, it's congenital, it will be sporadic and it's malar disease, of course. But from 1 to 35, it's MAG disease. Above 35, it's lymphedema tarda. Those three types, malary, MAG and tarda, are primary lymphedema. Indication for surgery. When to do surgery for lymphedema? If we have a marked disability 
or lymphedema causing a proximal lymphatic obstruction with beta and distal lymphatic suitable for lymphatic drainage procedure or lymphocutaneous fistula and mega lymphatic. The procedure are home and operation and this requires the preservation of overlying skin so the skin must be in good quality or child operation which will be removing everything from the edema and taking a split thickness graft over the, the remnant granulation tissue below and the limo, lymphovenous anastomosis. By the way, the super micro surgery is the hope for lymphedema in the upcoming days. Even if MRCS doesn't consider this, but this is the hope. I can show you many cases uh, done by the Korean team and the Japanese team uh, about the lymphovenous and smoothest super microsurgery. Aortic dissection is more common than rupture of the abdominal aorta. 33% 30, of the patient will die within the first 24 hours, unfortunately and 50% will die within 48 hours if no treatment received. So it must be in your mind. You have to be oriented that aortic dissection is happening and can be saved as well if you can know that this is aortic dissection. So it's associated with hypertension. Features of aortic dissection is there in the intimal layer followed by formation and the propagation of subintimal hematoma, cystic median necrosis, and Marfan syndrome. Marfan syndrome must be in your mind. Most common site of dissection, 90% occurring within the 10 centimeters of the aortic valve. We have two classification for the dissection, mainly Stanford classification with A and B, and the Bigge classification, which are three types. The Stanford classification, A and B, A ascending, P descending. A for surgery of aortic root replacement. P is for medical therapy with antihypertensive with the descending aorta. The BK classification are three types. Ascending aorta and aortic arch and descending aorta. This is type 1. Type 2 when it involves only the ascending aorta. And according to the Stanford classification, we stated that ascending aorta or the aortic root, it will require surgery aortic root replacement. So in the big classification type 1 and 2 ascending aorta or ascending aorta only or ascending aorta arch as descending aorta in type 1 the BK it will require surgery while the descending aorta which is type 3 in the BK or type P in Stanford will require medical therapy with antihypertensive. So again dissection of the aorta clinical features will be tearing, sudden onset of chest pain, Painless in only 10%, so most commonly will be tearing pain in the chest. Hypertension, hypotension means he is falling down. A blood pressure difference in each arm greater than 20 millimeter mercury. This is a very good sign to detect and think of aortic dissection. Neurological deficit for about 20% of the cases. In the investigation, the chest x-ray will show a widened mediastinum, abnormal aortic knob, ring sign, and deviation of the trachea and esophagus. The CT angiography of the thoracic aorta will be clear, of course, but we are talking about the chest x-ray, which is the first thing to do uh, when we are suspecting uh, chest tearing pain. It can be done as well. So you have to be aware that a widened mediastinum as well as abnormal aortic knob and ring sign deviation of the trachea and the esophagus with no other chest signs think of this patient might having a dissection of the aorta. MRI and geography and CT and geography will be clear of course and conventional and geography now really used to diagnosis. This is brain surgeon take care in bypass operation using PTFE, the polytetrafluoroacetylene alone graft, will not give a good result, as the subintimal hyperplasia will give a very poor outcome early within six months. And a very common recall about this, where a patient done uh, polytetrafluoroacetylene uh, graft alone without Miller cuff, and got complication after six months, and asking you what is the cause, the answer was subintimal hyperplasia. So take care. Using a vein cuff, a Miller cuff, 
at the end of the bullet tetra fluoroethylene graft will improve the situation. And take care, in a patient with varicose vein, how come to take a vein as a conduit in this bypass? A varicose vein means the vein can't be reliably used as a conduit. Your body doesn't depend on your own vein. You will depend it in surgery. What confidence you have in this vein? However, the construction of a Miller calf vein can be done with a vein from another anatomical site. So again, BTFE with Miller calf is the rule right now. And take care of the level you are taking to your bypass towards. We all agree that aneurysm, abdominal aortic aneurysm diameter cut off is 5 cm. And above 5 cm, you should go for surgery. Why is this? Because the risk of abdominal aortic aneurysm rupture over 5 years is from 5 to 5.9 cm, 25% of the cases will rupture, and 6 to 6.9 cm will rupture in 35% of the patient, and 7 cm and over, 75% of the patient will have their abdominal aortic aneurysm rupture. And by the way, the aorta is somehow is important, right? Ivar, the endovascular aortic aneurysm repair done by the vast majority of the cardiothoracic or the even the trained vascular surgeons, uh, the aneurysm have to be long neck, straight iliac vessel, and healthy groin vessel. So take care. But take care, the use of fenestrated graft can allow the suprarenal aortic aneurysm to be treated as well. An important trick how you have to use it from now is to read the last line in the question because it might be a direct simple question doesn't relate to the question scenario. It will save you lots of time. This is during your study and during your exam. In the exam if you faced or in the mock if you faced a very known question you are used to just make sure that judge the choices and there is no traps in the question but go for the answer you know the first answer will come up to your mind is the most probable correct answer you will answer ever charcot foot is a condition causing weakening of the bone of the foot that can occur in people who have significant nerve damages or neuropathy the bone are weakened enough to fracture and with continued walking, the foot eventually change in shape. Dear great surgeon, looking forward to see your names after many uh, new innovations in the medicine, just like Jules Martin Charcot, who defines the Charcot joint and the Charcot foot. Charcot is not a definition; it's a named after the Jean Martin, Doctor Jean Martin Charcot, who described Charcot foot. No short could joint or shark could foot, there are clinical findings and radiological findings will support your diagnosis. The erythema, edema, and change in the temperature and neuropathic foot, as well as plantar ulcers, uh, those are often difficult to differentiate osteomyelitis from shark could foot, foot. So, uh, they may have similar tagged YBC scan and MRI feature, the joint destruction and dislocation and edema. So the definitive diagnosis may require a bone or synovial biopsy. Regarding the radiological finding, our 6D, distended joint, density increase, debris production and dislocation as well as disorganization and destruction. Distended joint, density increase, debris production, dislocation, disorganization and destruction. So again, Distended joint, density increase, debris production, dislocation, disorganization, and destruction. Six Cs. In charcoal joint, there is a funny term called lick the candy stick. Keep it in your mind. It didn't come before in the exam, but I like it. Lick the candy stick. Appear and commonly seen as the distal aspect of the metatarsal atrophic changes appear and diabetic osteolysis and poor resorption. Lick the candy stick. Dr. Shark it was a funny one. Adductor canal compression syndrome and most commonly present in young male and is important differential diagnosis in men and the main differential diagnosis is the popliteal fossa entrapment syndrome. So again, the adductor canal compression syndrome 
caused by compression of the femoral artery by a musculotendinous band from the adductor magnus muscle. The treatment consists of division of the abnormal band and restriction of the arterial circulation. In the adductor canal syndrome, if we extend the leg, the popliteal pulse will disappear. In the popliteal artery syndrome, in the popliteal fossa syndrome, entrapment, the popliteal artery pulsation will disappear after flexion. You have to be familiar with the cardiac murmurs. The ejection systolic murmur is very famous for aortic stenosis, pulmonary stenosis, ASD, and phallus as well. While the band systolic murmur is very famous for the mitral regurgitation, tricuspid regurgitation, and VST. The late systolic murmur is very famous for mitral valve prolapse, coarctation of the aorta as well. While the early diastolic will be with aortic regurgitation and gram steel murmur, while the mid diastolic with the mitral stenosis and Austin Flint murmur. From all those conditions, you have to focus especially for ejection systolic murmur with the aortic stenosis and the pan systolic murmur is mitral regurgitation, mitral regurgitation, pan systolic murmur, aortic stenosis, ejection systolic murmur. Those are very important common records. A cardiac patient who have been lately discharged from the hospital coming to you with severe abdominal pain and sudden onset of abdominal pain with collapse. What are you thinking of other than a sudden onset of impulse which causes acute superior mesenteric artery impulse? By the way, if you are a general surgeon, you will wonder how many cases are missed in the ER no matter what country you are coming from or you are going through or you having your training for. It's a matter of your priorities in your head. Are you thinking of acute superior mesenteric artery embolus in a cardiac patient or not? Are you thinking of the MVO as a differential or not? Keep it in mind, please. From the case of acute superior mesenteric artery, the main key will be that the patient have myocardial infarction. And by the way, when the patient is AF, must raise in your head that he might be acute superior mesenteric artery embolus or MVO, whatever the case. So, please keep the patient set in mind and be systematic in your examination whatever the cause of your rec of your call in the er is if the er uh, doctor call you for examining this patient and you find this patient is asking you about abdominal pain please go systematic for your examination this will help you in your exam and your in your real life we are assessing general and local and general before local and general including the vital sign so, in this vital sign of this patient, you find him irritable. You will find him might be feverish and you will check the pulse. He will be tacky and will be AF at well. This will raise AF plus abdominal pain what he's thinking for. Isn't this might be MVO? Isn't this might be acute superior mesenteric artery M plus? This is a sudden pain. I have seen cases the patient came with diarrhea, bloody diarrhea, and was missed. So keep this in mind. Subclinian steel syndrome is very important in the exam and its characteristic present with superior circulation symptoms, such as dizziness and vertigo due to exertion of an arm. There is a subclavian artery stenoocclusive disease proximal to the origin of the vertebral artery and is associated with the flow reversal in the vertebral artery, by the way. The management involves percutaneous transluminal angioplasty or stent. Vascular surgeons have done a marvelous job with the endovascular surgery, by the way. Subclavian artery is very important, by the way. We have two subclavian arteries. The left and the right. The left subclavian come directly from the arch of the aorta, while the right subclavian artery arise from the brachiocephalic artery or the brachiocephalic trunk. So, from the origin, the subclavian artery travels laterally, passing between the anterior and the middle scaly muscle, and this is important for the thoracic outlet syndrome, and laterally passing between the anterior and middle scaly muscle again. So deep to the scalenus anterior and anterior to the scalenus medial 
as the subclavian artery crosses the lateral border of the first rib, it becomes the axillary artery. So it's important, by the way. And it's important not it's a continuation as axillary artery at this point, uh, superficial to the subclavian triangle, but because it's giving a very important branches like the vertebral artery, internal thoracic artery, sinocervical trunk, coastal cervical trunk, and dorsal subscapular scapular artery. So vitamin C and D are the branches of the subclavian artery. Vitamin C and D vertebral artery, internal thoracic artery, side cervical trunk, coastal cervical trunk, and dorsal scapular artery. So it's merely giving the brain, thyroid, and the breast, as well as its continuation as axillary artery, giving a blood supply for the upper limb. So to some extent, it might be important. Do you agree? To understand subclavian steel syndrome, if there is a stenosis in one side, the vertebral artery of this occluded side is supposed in normal situation to giving the blood from the subclavian to the vertebral artery to the brain to enter the circular phyllis. But if there is an occlusion or a stenosis in the subclavian vein, uh, subclavian artery on this side, the vertebral artery will be giving a retrograde from the brain to the subclavian continuation. Again, in normal situation, the subclavian artery is giving a branch called vertebral artery, which is entering the circle of wellness to form a blood supply to the brain. So, the basilar artery at this situation where the subclavian artery is stenosed at the same side, instead of giving the blood to the brain, it will be draining blood from the brain to the subclavian artery. In a retrograde way. Take care. When we have a patient with bilateral occlusion of both common iliac arteries or even Lurich syndrome, the patient with a major cardiac comorbidities, the safest option is to choose an extra anatomical bypass like the axillo bifemoral bypass graft because the long term patency rate are less good than uh, with the aortic bifemoral bypass. However, the operation is less major. And if the patient have unilateral common iliac artery occlusion and with a major cardiac comorbidities, you will choose an extra atomical bypass from a femoral femoral bypass. From the femoral good side to the diseased side and the blocked side bypass it will be subcutaneous by the way because he is not fit for a major operation from the aorta to the femoral or to femoral bypass most of the females will face the renal disease it's an idiopathic condition which affect young female usually affecting hand more than feet the digit become white then blue then red it's color changes treatment will be calcium antagonist or keeping hair warm because it's more manifesting in the cold weather and cold condition. There is great surgeon, take care. Acute limb ischemia where thrombosis of pre-existing site of atherosclerosis is the commonest cause of acute limb ischemia by the way, or acute thrombosis of popliteal aneurysm poses a great threat to the limb or sudden occlusion of the large proximal vessel result in a typical appearance of acute limb ischemia, it will appear with three presentation according when you are seeing this limb. If you have seen a white leg, it's less than six hour limb ischemia. If you have seen mottled limb with plunging on pressure, it has been acute limb ischemia from six to 12 hours. But fixed modeling, it will be more than 12 to 24 hours. So take care. The earlier the better. You can save this limb. Acute limb ischemia means you have to save this limb. Time equal ischemia. Six hours will be white. 12 hours mottled the skin. More than 12 hours, it will be fixed color changes. Fixed color changes, fixed modeling. It will be an uh, amputation, but the dusky 
and uh, mild anesthesia it will be uh, requiring angiography and reassessment the white leg with uh, sensory motor deficit surgery and embryectomy is a must so time is ischemia time is limp you can save the acute limb ischemia by earlier diagnosis of the limb in acute limb ischemia intraarterial thrombolysis is better than peripheral thrombolysis and indicated in acute or chronic thrombosis the role of thrombolysis avoid if within two months this patient has cardiovascular uh, angioplasty or two weeks post surgery aspiration of the clot may improve the success rate of the thrombosis is very large take care the role of surgery in acute limb ischemia both groin should be prepared by the way and the transverse arterial tomy is easier to close uh, than the longitudinal arteriotomy by the way bore inflow should be managed with iliac troll if this fails to improve then consider femoral crossover or axillofemoral crossover a check angiogram should be performed on the table prior to closure systemic hebronization should follow all the over the surgery Fasciotomy should be considered if the time between the onset and the surgery exceeded 6 hours. The most important sign will come in your exam is the color of the limb. If it's white, so consider surgery or embolectomy. If it's dusky or uh, plunging on pressure, we are talking about 6 to 12 hours uh, and angiography is a must to reassess the limb. But fixed color changes, it's requiring a primary amputation. This is effective modeling. It's more than 12 to 24 hour ischemia. This will cause a reperfusion injury which may threaten his whole life, not only his limb. A venous leg ulcer overlying the medial malleolus, the gator area. Take care. Routine use of antibiotic is not advised. As this may predispose to resistant organism. So, a multi layer bandage may provide compression equivalent to 40 mm mercury may be useful a large arsenal may be considered for skin grafting if the bed is granulating and healthy they shouldn't be treated with compression stocking if the ankle brachial pressure index is about 0.4 take care and remember and bentoxifilin may be the ulcer healing because bentoxifilin was subjected to a Cochrane review, by the way, and shown to improve healing rate. So again, treatment with daily low dose of fluoxacillin on whatever antibiotic ulcer is not treated with antibiotics. Ulcers it's treating with treating the cause and making sure that this ulcer is not malignant. Remember, arterial ulcer occur at the toes and the heel and it's very painful and there may be areas of gangrene and cold with no palpable pulse as well as low ankle brachial pressure index measurement is important because it will be showing a very low ankle brachial pressure index measurement. And remember, the ankle brachial pressure index is measured by lower limb systolic pressure over the upper limb systolic pressure. That's why if it's a low, this means that the lower limb pressure is low and there is no blood is reaching there. And by the way, the arterial ulcer is combined with, yes, the leg will be um, not edematous at all. It will be instead, it will be shrunken. Here regarding the neuropathic ulcer pathway, it's commonly over the plantar surface of the metatarsal head and the plantar surface of the halysis. The plantar neuropathic ulcer is a condition that most commonly lead to amputation in diabetic patient if not taken care of well due to pressure and management include cushionoid shoes to reduce the callus formation. Uh, please, please take care in neuropathic ulcer to assess the bone, the vasculature and the ulcer itself. Never forget in treating a diabetic food ulcer with all its components. There is a bone, there is a vascular, there is a flesh. 
make x-ray to make sure there is no osteomyelitis. Make arterial duplex to make sure there is no angiopathies there and there is no ischemia and the blood is reaching there. Because if you have deprived the diabetic foot before angioplasty, it will cause the diabetic foot to go more ischemia and, and will die. And assess the ulcer itself to make sure it's a neuropathic ulcer, it's a pressure ulcer. And by the way, the pressure ulcer is not treated with any flaps as long as the pressure is, is still existing. What is, the, what is the gain if you are doing a major flap to cover a, a pressure ulcer and the patient keep pressing pressure on it, it will ulcer it again and you will lose your flap. To continue our ulcer uh, talk, Let's talk about the bioderma gangrenosum. It's associated with the inflammatory bowel disease, can occur at the stoma site, and the erythematous nodule or pustule uh, will ulcerate. Uh, this will give you the key in your exam about the bioderma gangrenosum ulcers. Always keep in mind the marginal ulcer, the precancerous or the cancerous ulcer is a non-healing chronic ulcer. It's a, sw a squamous cell carcinoma occurring at the site of chronic inflammation, either pain or somalitis after 10 to 20 years. And don't take 10 to 20 years only. If a non-healing long-term ulcer, keep in mind to take a biopsy or excision biopsy to treat it as a marginal ulcer alternative otherwise. And in the exam, your key to the marginal ulcer most common with the burn ulcer non-healing. Mainly occur in the lower limb, but it can occur in any site of non-healing ulcer all over the body. Take care. In mesenteric vein thrombosis, the, the history will be over weeks. And abdominal sign and symptom will not occur until venous thrombosis has reached a stage to compromise the, the arterial flow itself. And thrombophilia account for 60% of the cases. And intraoperative, you will find a patches of infarction. Venous leg ulcer. They are mostly due to venous hypertension, secondary to chronic venous ulceration uh, insufficiency. The ulcer formed due to capillary, fibrin cuff, or leukocyte sequestration. The features of a venous insufficiency include edema, brown pigmentation, lipodermatosclerosis, and eczema. Again, edema, brown pigmentation, and famous for the lipodermatosclerosis, and you will see it when you know it, and eczema. The location above the ankle, and it will be painless. The location above the ankle is called gator's area. Deep venous insufficiency is related to previous DVT, by the way, and superficial venous insufficiency is associ associated with the varicose vein. So, deep venous insufficiency, DVT. Superficial venous insufficiency, varicose vein. Varicose vein, superficial. Deep, uh, DVT, deep venous insufficiency. Make it clear, please. Either ways, Doppler ultrasound, look for the presence of the reflux and duplex ultrasound. Looks at the anatomy. So, Doppler, you will hear. Duplex, you will see with your eyes. Management with four layer compression bandage after exclusion of arterial disease, please. You have to exclude any arterial, please. Any arterial compromisation, even it's clear in your eyes, it's a gator area, please. To do compression bandage, there must be no arterial disease or you will cause this limb to be ischemic. If fail to heal after 12, uh, 12 weeks, or it's more than 10 centimeters, skin grafting may be needed if the healthy granulation tissue of the ulcer appear. Again, again, chronic non-healing ulcer, non-traumatic ulcer is cancer until proven otherwise. Whatever the case, whatever the site, non-healing ulcer, chronic non-healing ulcer, non-traumatic ulcer is cancer until proven otherwise. Doubler or duplex. In doubler you will hear, in duplex you will see, and here so duplex is like a combo offer so you can hear and see and when you can see and hear why do you choose hearing only with doubler when you can see and hear with duplex so please choose duplex whenever it exists in your exam duplex and doubler it's like radio and tv i know some are uh, old-fashioned and like the classic radio but please 
In examination, give your patient the best choice and give him a TV. If he choose radio, it's up to his choice. No, it's your choice to give him the TV. Give your patient the best solution. Duplex, not Doppler. Medial arcuate ligament syndrome occur when the diaphragm sits lower than the normal. The purpose, the purpose of the medial arcuate ligament is to provide a hole for the aorta to pass through the diaphragm through the diaphragmatic aortic hiatus while the body is developing but if it's too low if the arcuate ligament is too low uh, it compresses the celiac artery and the celiac ganglion nerve creating a myriad symptom we know that at least 15 percent of the population has medial arcuate ligament syndrome but we don't know why approximately 1% of this population experience the symptom because of it. So, awareness is important. And by the way, it's a diagnosis by exclusion. So again, median arc ligament syndrome normally is higher level than the celiac artery. If it came near the celiac artery and below the normal side uh, of the aortic hiatus, it will compress the celiac artery and will cause symptoms. Someone asked me about what does it mean that median arcuate ligament syndrome is a diagnosis of exclusion. This means that the, the patient will come to you with epigastric pain. And we, okay, there is no palpable mass will be found. So, the epigastric pain will be investigated with ultrasound and even CT. You will do amylase, you will exclude pancreatitis, you will exclude every cause of epigastric pain and you will think of the median arcuate ligament syndrome. It will be diagnosed by exclusion and a very uh, eminent radiologist who will find this sign in the CT. So the median arcuate ligament syndrome there will be no gallstone, there will be no mass, there will be no amylase, there will be nothing in the differential of the epigastric pain, even angina or myocardial infarction, you will think of all possible epigastric pain causes and you will exclude them. And then when you are doing your CT and geography or duplex, you will think of the medial arcuate ligament syndrome. If you keep in mind, you might think of it earlier, just like Dr. House. It's a Dr. House medial arcuate ligament syndrome level. It's not the normal to see it because about 50% of the population have median arcuate ligament syndrome, but only 1% from the 15% of the population have manifestations. The key of the median arcuate ligament syndrome in the exam, not in your real life, will be severe epigastric pain that was post brandial and you will give you in the question that he has excluded already all the possible causes. You will say there is no gallstone, there is no OGD, there is no uh, infarction, there is no, 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 and your key will be epigastric pain was post brandial. If the patient is not ambulant, he doesn't move, he is on wheelchair. This reminds us of the question of the patient who is having a fixed knee flexion deformity. There will be no use of uh, revascularization of the limb and the exam will focus that there is a hope for revascularization with above knee uh, or uh, bypass femoral, femoral or uh, from the uh, aortofemoral, aortodestal what he will gain from this maneuver he is still not ambulant he is not moving and he has a fixed knee deformity so in both cases above knee amputation will give this patient a better choice a better chance اذا مايلنا اللي بيتكلموا بالعربي مهم جدا ان احنا ناخد بالنا هو العيان ده بيتحرك ولا ما بيتحركش نعرف هو الراجل دوت او الحاله اللي هو بيتكلم عليها هو اساسا هيستفاد بالريفاسكولاريزيشن اللي احنا هنفكر نعمله هتلاقي السؤال خداع عماله بيحكي لك ان العيان دوت ممكن يكون تعبان وممكن يكون كويس في الحالتين هيقول لك ان في امل ان انت ممكن تعمل ريفاسكولاريزيشن وهيزقك على ده لكن الفكره كلها ان العيان ده اساسا رجله ثابت على كده الركبه بتاعته مثلا هيقول لك مره انها عنده فيكسد فليكشن ديفورمتي هتلاقي ركبته متنيه ومش هيقدر يفردها تاني ايا كان السبب وبقت ستيف هيستفاد ايه لو عملنا لنا ديفاسكولاريشن ديستال 
مش الراجل ده هيستفاد اكتر لو احنا عملنا له ابوف ني امبيوتيشن وركبنا له بروسيس لو هو بيتحرك طب لو هو اساسا ما بيتحركش انا هستفاد ايه من ان انا اعمل له ريفاسولاريزيشن انا كده هدخل عيان هاي ريسك الريسك هو في غنى عنه مش هيستفاد بيه هو كده كده مش هيتحرك تاني رن اوف فيزل مينز ذا ديستال ارتريز ار بيتنت اند كان بي كوندكتد اذ ذي ار نوت بيتنت They are not healthy for conduction, and there is no use to open artery for them. So happy that you are thinking of postprandial pain is a serious event that might include mesenteric vascular disease, and of course, CT angiogram would be the best choice to investigate for the suspected mesenteric vascular disease. But take care, we are not treating a disease; we are managing a patient. The patient, when he has impaired kidney functions why we go with CT angiogram when we can get an efficient radiologist and do a duplex ultrasound scan start with the duplex ultrasound scan and if it's not definitive we can think the alternative causes and alternative choices and prepare the patient for any other more serious investigation Happy that you thought of the mesenteric vascular disease, but take care we are managing a patient, not treating a disease. So CT angiogram is the best choice to investigate for the mesenteric vascular disease. But if he is having an impaired renal function, start with the less invasive duplex ultrasound scan for the abdomen. And if it's not conclusive, we can think of more aggressive options like the CT angiogram or whatever we can do. But start with the duplex ultrasound for impaired renal function patients suspected with mesenteric vascular disease because he is experiencing postprandial abdominal pain. Keep in mind that lymphedema may complicate redo varicose vein surgery. And if the presentation is mild, management will be using a compression bandage. And by the way, diuretics doesn't help at all in cases with true lymphedema. Dramatic response with underlying cause management. So femoral crossover graft are an option for treatment of iliac occlusion on one side in a patient with significant comorbidities and healthy contralateral vessel uh, is healthy. Someone asked me why not axillo femoral bypass. Take care. If you have unilateral occlusion of the iliac and the other limb is well nourished, have a good supply from uh, the iliac and there is no occlusion. The axilla is high above and the other iliac is near from you. The other femoral is near from you. You take from the far one or the near one. So take from the near one the other femoral. Especially if the condition of the patient have high comorbidities and not healthy. If you want to limp salvage. So you take from the nearest side which is the femoral. But the axilla is high. We use only the axilla for bifemoral bypass. If the post limb. Because we are taking from far. So when we take from the far away artery from the axilla you have from the axillary artery bypass take for the both sides but here we have unilateral only if you have bilateral go for the axilla from the far away to save both limbs or you have another limb is amputated don't think of the puzzling don't puzzle yourself know the, complex, the concept of the idea and you will get it Logic is the main idea of the whole medicine. The greater softness vein with the softness vein, but the sural nerve with the short softness vein. 